This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financiers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up today, Russ Capper sits down with Craig Beckman, CEO of Myox Incorporated, this company from Albuquerque, New Mexico, helping clean water by bringing better chemistry to the well site. Next up, Robin Canoke checks in from Austin, Texas, where she meets with Jack Roberts, CEO of Concert, the San Antonio-based energy management company helping bring intelligent conservation to Texas. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show. My guest now, Craig Beckman, President and CEO of Myx Corporation. Craig, welcome to the Energy Maker Show. Thanks, Russ. Good to be here. All right. And we're talking about water today, and more specifically, clean water. So with that, tell us about Myox. Sure. Myox has its history in water treatment. For 15 years, we've produced an alternate form of chlorine for drinking water and swimming pools. We're now leveraging that technology base to look at what other chemistries we could produce on site, on demand for industrial customers. The technology goes back to the Los Alamos labs where they had a grant from the U.S. government to focus on electrochlorination and coming up with a more effective process. What they found in that research was that not only could they make a more effective treatment with a form of chlorine, but they could also change the attributes of that product with changing the design of the electrolytics that it was made in to come up with different applications. Okay, so but so city municipalities were and have been a key customer. Yes, so most of our installed base today is for drinking water. Uh, we are an alternative to either gas or liquid bleach, a form of chlorine. Chlorine is by far and away the m- most common and uh, effective treatment for drinking water globally. However, the forms it comes in typically in the past have been either gas or liquid and both offer or both have significant safety risks in handling. Okay, and so the Myox method, which involves what, overcomes this? Yeah, so the Myox method actually involves taking salt to the site. So instead of delivering a hazardous chemical, you're delivering inert salt. Uh, In addition, the volume is much less because it's 100% salt, which we turn into the chlorine on site. So you deliver the salt, you mix it with water that's already on site, activated through our machine, and you can create the chlorine that is used at that site on demand and as they need it each day in a much safer fashion. Okay, well describe the machine or machines. Sure, so uh, electrolytic cell technology is basically electricity So we have a positive side of the cell and a negative side, and we create a brine solution, uh, just salty water, run that through the electrolytic cell, and it converts that brine to a form of chlorine that then is stored in a tank and then used on demand at that pool or that municipality or that wastewater plant. Okay, and so this might be a a washing machine size piece of equipment? Sure, depends on how much flow they want to treat. So, for example, we just did a small community in New Mexico that had a population of maybe 300 people. Um, That system was the size of a home water softener, maybe a foot in diameter, four feet tall. Uh, We also treat water in Bogota, Colombia. Um, That plant is the size of a couple large refrigerators with some tanks that are 10 feet in diameter. Okay. So, uh, along the way, as you said in the very beginning, it was determined, wow, there's there's a lot of uh, additional opportunity for cleaning water and that's kind of moved you into the space of the energy maker show it has yeah so we've made a pretty dramatic shift in the last two years of focusing on some industrial verticals uh, specifically cooling in the energy production area mm-hmm. and oil and gas really focused on the upstream and midstream segment 
in looking at what specialty chemicals they use today that we could replace that would give them a much greener and safer alternative. Well, I can tell you that based upon the uh, the guests that we've had on the Energy Maker Show, there's a lot of interest uh, in being able to do that today. So are you having success? We are. Yes, we are having success. Uh, we've had a number of customers run trials with our chemistry already for frac flowback and frac treatment. So today in the fracking industry, the raw material for a frac is water, sand, a propellant, and a disinfectant. The disinfectant they use today is relatively hazard and not easily handled. And we can offer an alternative that's both easier to handle and if there ever was a contamination, would be much safer because it's the same chemical they use in their pool or their drinking water. Okay, well, wow, impressive. So, I mean, from what we've seen, there, there's the the debate on on the amount of water being hauled around and and, and both clean and dirty. And, sure. and uh, we hear about people trying to reuse the water. I assume that you sort of play in all those categories. We do play. Uh, so that water that's used in the fracking uh, percentage, maybe 10 to 30 percent, depending on the formation comes back up to the surface in the first month after the well is drilled. The preferred solution for that water is to put it back into another frack so that it doesn't have a chance to contaminate anything else. However, that water often has high chemical demand and often actually does carry some bacteria or could grow bacteria as it's stored before it goes into the next frack. So again, our chemistry can treat that water so it could be more effectively reused. What happens if you put water back in that has bacteria in it? Yeah, so if you put uh, water or sand, either one, mm -hmm. the things they're concerned about, that have bacteria, they have the potential to create what are called sulfur-reducing bacteria blooms or growth that can both slow down the production of the well and also create byproducts such as hydrogen sulfide that make the oil or gas more expensive and difficult to refine once it does come up to the surface. Okay. Well, it must be exciting time for your, your board and your owners and, and everybody in the company right now to be suddenly focused on this huge new industry. Yes, very much so. Um, our history in the municipal segment um, is certainly still part of our business, but we see much more uh, explosive growth in these areas because we're addressing problems that are critical and potentially can open up more energy development. Okay. Well, Craig, I really appreciate you coming in and sharing your story. Thanks, Russ. Pleasure. You bet. That's Craig Beckman, the president and CEO of Myox Corporation. We'll be back with more after this. Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show. Hi, I'm Robin Kanok. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show. Today, I'm here with Jack Roberts, the CEO of Concert, a very interesting company out of San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Robin. Good, Good to have you to be here. with you. Thanks for joining me. Okay, so Concert does some really cool things. What is Concert? Concert is an energy management company. A lot of people refer to us as doing intelligent conservation. Uh, one of the things that we're known for mm -hmm. is our uh, trademark product called a virtual peak plant. Mm -hmm. But we are in the virtual peak plant business, we're in the intelligent conservation business, but broadly in the energy management business. Okay, we're gonna have to explain what a virtual peak plant is to our- Okay, well a virtual peak plant means that we can provide to a utility the functionality required of a peak plant, let's say a gas-fired peak plant. Mm -hmm. And we can do that without burning anything. We can do it basically with intelligent conservation. Mm -hmm. So who is your end user then? We have two customers, if you will. Okay. I'm going to go to the secondary one first. Okay. Um, that customer is the consumer or small business. 
and I will I will refer to consumers more than small businesses, but every time it's the same. It's a relatively small user of electricity. Okay. For that person, we give them several capabilities, uh, but basically the end result is save money, save the planet, pay nothing. Good deal. Mm-hmm. Good deal. Okay. The primary customer we have is an electric utility. And for them, we provide the virtual peak plant. And the economics are so good from our virtual peak plant that they can provide all of the capabilities I just described to the consumer for free. Mm -hmm. So for the utility, they get the ability to avoid building new plants, burning fuel, they get better OPEX, they get better everything than they would if they bought a similar capacity gas-fired peaker. Okay, to just cover that peak demand time. Well, it can do a variety of things. Okay. Uh, it can do what is known in Texas as an aggregated load resource. That's the current term of art. It may change soon. Uh, it can do, uh, that is a part of what would be called ancillary services. It can do uh, peak shaving, peak shaping, uh, mm-hmm. It can do a variety of mm-hmm. things, including improving operational efficiencies. So who are your customers today? Which utilities are you doing business with? Well, uh, the premier customer we have today is CPS Energy, the municipal electric and gas utility in San Antonio, Texas. Uh-huh. We have several other large investor-owned utilities, including Constellation, which is a part of Exelon, recently merged. We have also uh, Central Hudson in New York and Con Ed, Consolidated Edison in New York. We have a variety of municipals and cooperatives around the country. Uh, in Texas, specifically, we have Blue Bonnet here close to Austin. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also have Grayson Collin, north of Dallas. And we're in discussions with a variety of others here and pretty much uh, in a wide distribution across the country. Very interesting. So you moved your headquarters to San Antonio from North Carolina. We did. Um, that happened about a year ago? In, Ju- in July, roughly, of last year, okay. yes. Okay. You want to tell us what brought about that decision? I guess mutually supportive objectives. <laughs> uh, for our part, we had proven that it all works. We'd tested it, we'd proven it, we'd shown it in a number of places. But we really needed a major utility who was committed, who was ready to roll this out at scale and show what it really looked like at scale. Mm-hmm. Some utilities, I would say, are a little reluctant to be the first mover. Some like to follow. Well, we found one who was prepared to be the prime mover, and that's CVS. Mm-hmm. So we wanted a substantial deployment of our virtual peak plant. Turns out CVS wanted to have companies in San Antonio. So we found a mutual way to get to that place. What you do, demand management, um, a lot of people refer to as demand response, but I'm in agreement with you. It's more of a demand management Mm -hmm. um, tool. We've had that around for a very long time, but we've only thought of it in in an emergency response type situation. Um, All of the programs set up for that historically have been emergency response through ERCOT, the ISO for Texas. So... You want to explain a little bit of the mind shift that you think has to occur in order for it to be thought of as an economically viable resource? Uh, I don't want to be too harsh with anything that might be deemed competitive, but that said, uh, demand response as classically imagined Mm -hmm. is intrusive and difficult to the consumer to such an extent that they're generally paid a stipend. They either get a free thermostat for playing or they get $25, $50 a year for putting up with it. And and they are also, generally the deal is you can only use it 10 or 12 times because it doesn't do anything for the consumer. You're different. We're different. We're giving the consumer the ability to save 10 to 20% on his electric bill. And that's what he gets. Mm -hmm. So what devices at the residential level would you tap into as a resource? Well, in Texas and other places that are summer peaking, hot Mm -hmm. places, Uh uh, we have found through our data that you can control 50 to 60 percent of the home consumption with three classes of devices, HVAC, water heaters, pool pumps. 
Those are big and interruptible and make a lot of difference. In fact, we found that uh, in Texas, everyone knows that residential demand uh, grows in the summer. What they don't know is that it triples. Residential demand triples from April to August uh, and small commercial roughly doubles. So the numbers are very large. Mm -hmm. And if you don't deal with those two items, you've left 75% of the problem unaddressed. And in fact, that's the 75% that's causing the problem of summer peaks in Texas. So that's what we do. And we found that the most cost effective thing we can do is those three classes of devices. And obviously if you've got two pool pumps, we deal with that. Three mm -hmm. water heaters, we deal with that. Four air conditioners, we deal with that. Mm -hmm. But it's those types of devices. We're capable of controlling up to 256 per home, 256 different things. And over the fullness of time, we'll deal with plug loads and a variety of other things. But for now, we're going where the money is, and the money's in those three things. Jack, my house is hot in August because it's hot outside. So you're telling me that if I use concert as my demand management in my home, that I'm not going to I'm not going to feel a significant difference. That you manage it in a way that is reasonable to the end user. First off, we don't manage it. Okay. You manage it. That's an okay. important okay. distinction. Okay. Good. That's a good point. Uh, you manage it, and uh, what you do is we put in these this group of equipment items at your home. Uh, secondly, uh, installed in that is a smart energy uh, uh, home profile. Okay. Uh, and what you do then is go onto our website. It will be branded with your local utility. And you'll go onto that website and you will set up your own profiles. You do that by answering first 13 questions. What time does the first person get up in the morning at your house? What time does the last person go to bed at night? Do you want hot water available all night or not? Those kinds of questions. Do you ever work from home? Those kinds of questions. That will so lifestyle a, questions. Lifestyle questions will create a, a rough template of how you live at your house. Generally, that causes people to set up three or four profiles. The most common are weekdays, if you will, work days, mm -hmm. weekends, vacation, and for some people, work at home. You can have as many as you want. But those three or four are the basic yeah. ones. Mm -hmm. And in those... You say when you want what to happen. Mm -hmm. The way you save money is by eliminating what I call ghost consumption. Ghost consumption I define as largely changing the temperature of air and water when it does not benefit you. Our data says that most people use hot water four hours a day or less. The other 20 hours, it's just returning to the set point. Well, I don't know when you need hot water, but you do. Uh, when you, we talk about your comfort, well, it's hot in Texas, as you've identified. But do you care how hot it is in your house when you're not there? Right. Unless you have pets or something, you know, you probably don't care. Mm -hmm. But if you have pets, you can figure out what you think is appropriate for them. Uh -huh. And what we find is that many people are gone for some portion of peak hours. Peak hours in Texas, May to September, 3 to 7 p.m. So if you're gone any part of that time, just your own management for your own economics will benefit the electric utility. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what the utility does additionally is it asks you for up to four degrees of freedom in your set points. And from time to time, they will draw on that. But you can opt out at any time. You can do it from the web, you can do it from the thermostat, at any time without limit the idea being that most people uh, once they know they have complete freedom to set up their own program and once they know if they're called on by the utility they can opt out they feel comfortable they feel better yeah your uh, concert is definitely the gold standard when it comes to demand management we like to think so well congratulations on all that success thank you and that wraps up our discussion with jack roberts the ceo of concerts